Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, It's wonderful to see you all here. Uh, As Eric said earlier, if you are a visitor among us, uh, here for the first time, or even watching for the first time online, uh, then a really warm welcome to you. As a church, we've been working our way through John's Gospel, and now we're up to John chapter 13. So will you turn with me in your Bibles to John 13. So John 13, and we'll start in the opening verse. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that his father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, Not my feet only, but my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, Buy what we need for the feast. 
or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. Well, it will be helpful if you keep your Bibles open in front of you, uh, so that you're able to follow along as we consider God's Word. But before we do that, will you join me now in prayer? Lord God, we thank you that yours is not a dead word, but rather, Father, you tell us that it is a living word, a word with power, a word with truth, a word that is able to transform the hardest heart by your Spirit. And so, Lord, we do pray, as we always do, for an outpouring now of your Holy Spirit, that, Holy Spirit, you would take these words that you have given us And Lord, you would plant them deep in our hearts. We pray, Lord, that as a people, as your people here in Bucklands Beach, Lord, that we would not be conformed to this world, but rather that we might be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Give us the grace to understand your word. Give us the grace to believe your word. And give us the grace to obey it. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, up to this point in John's gospel, uh, Jesus' ministry has largely been to the crowds, the world. But now he turns with a pointed attentiveness uh, to his disciples, uh, disciples whose performance up to this point has been uh, average to poor, and disciples who very soon will go from scraping a pass are to clear fail as they desert him in his hour of need. And so the question that we want to have in our minds as we work our way through these verses is what does Jesus have to say uh, to disciples like them, to disciples like us? Are disciples who, to be completely honest, underperform? Are disciples who recognize their own failures and often feel failures for it. And we might expect this to be a little bit like the parent-teacher interview for a naughty child. Uh, Just a long list of failures, shortcomings, things they should have done better. Uh, Just another confirmation that we are indeed the failures we feel that we are. And we might expect Jesus to speak those uh, fateful words over us that we have, many of us heard. Uh, you will never amount to anything. I'm not angry with you. I'm just disappointed in you. Is Jesus just disappointed in us? Is that what he has to say to disciples like us? Well, as we work our way through these verses, uh, we can see Jesus' actions here through four different lenses, or from four different angles, each which gives us a different aspect of the word that Jesus has to say to his disciples. And the first lens through which we view Jesus' actions is as a demonstration of love. So like I mentioned earlier, by this point in John's gospel, it is mere hours before they will journey to Gethsemane. Uh, Judas will betray him, Peter will deny him, and the rest of the disciples will desert him in fear. Uh, John 13 through 17 really forms uh, John's equivalent to the Last Supper. Darkness approaches and the light will not shine much longer. And the sense we get in these verses is that Jesus knew this full well. If you look with me down at verse 1, it says that Jesus knew his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. If you glance your eyes over verse 11, he knew who was to betray him. Uh, The hour has come. 
and the seed must fall to the ground. And so these chapters really form Jesus' dying instructions to his disciples. Now, if you're a disciple of Jesus, it's worth getting to know these chapters well. And it's within this context that Jesus gets down on his knees and he begins to wipe each of the disciples' feet. Now, as hopefully you can see, even the very act of foot washing in itself is demeaning. You have to be down on your knees to do it. Our feet are not nice at the best of times. And in these days, sandals were the footwear of choice. Uh, To do it, you'd have to touch feet which are just covered in grime, sweat, and dust. It's the work of a servant or a slave. It's lowly and demeaning and degrading. In fact, there were even laws within Judaism that said a Hebrew slave should never have to wash somebody else's feet because of how utterly demeaning it was seen to be. As demeaning for a human, how much more is it demeaning for the very Lord of heaven and earth? So why would Jesus do this? Why would he degrade himself in this way? Well, if you glance your eyes over verse 1, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Why would he do it? Well, he would do it to show just how deeply he loved his disciples. He would do it to show just to what extent He was willing to go for them. Now, this might be the equivalent in today's day and age of something like washing toilets. Now, something that by its very nature seems to be demeaning and degrading. Right? A job no one wants. But we show love for other people by what we're willing to do for them. Now, you might remember the way that Uh, Jacob was willing to serve Laban for years and years on end out of his love for Rebekah. You might think of the way a husband might be willing to spend uh, extravagant amounts of money or effort uh, buying a gift for his wife. The way a mother might sit beside the bed of her sick child for hours and hours out of the overflow of love that she has for them. And like I mentioned earlier, it's it's only mere hours before every one of these disciples is going going to show themselves to be a colossal failure. Judas betrays, Peter denies, and all the rest without exception desert him. And yet he doesn't use this as an opportunity to chastise them, to express his deep disappointment in them. No, he wants them to know the very depths of the love that he has for them. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them right to the end. And actually, if you're a disciple of Jesus this morning, then Jesus wants you to know the love he has for you. He wants you to know that his is an enduring love a forever love, an unconditional love. He wants you to know that he was and is willing to descend to the darkest depths for your sake. And maybe in your own life, you quite regularly feel that you're a failing Christian, that you're a not very good Christian, or that you're an unworthy Christian. Don't doubt your Savior's love. Having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. Because that's what he's like. That's what he was like on earth. And that's what he continues to be like, sitting at the Father's right hand at this very moment. It's still the same beating heart of love that reaches out in dear love to his own. Uh, Will you receive and believe his love? 
So the first angle that we are to see Jesus' action is as a demonstration of a deep and humble love. The second angle through which we can understand what's going on here is as a picture of the cross. That it's an intentional foreshadowing of what's going to happen a mere 24 hours from now. And you can see this link to the cross playing out in his interactions with Peter. Uh, Jesus goes around each of the disciples washing their feet. And then he comes to Peter. And quite understandably, Peter protests. Our Lord, this isn't right. I should be washing your feet. It should be the other way around. But Jesus' words shed significant light on what's going on here. If you look at verse 8, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. It's absurd to think that this is still thinking about dirty feet. No, this is about a deeper washing. This is about a washing that's going to be produced not through water and a towel, but rather through his own blood poured out. Or if you look down at verse 10, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean. Uh, and it's a play on words there. Uh, the word clean that's used there is also the word that was used for ceremonial cleansing. A uh, cleansing in the temple, cleansing before God, cleansing usually by means of a sacrifice. You see, down on his knees, washing their feet, Jesus is prefiguring what he's about to do for them on the cruel cross. You see, what Peter needed to understand was that being a disciple of Jesus is not first about doing something for Jesus. No, it's first about Jesus doing something for us. Right? That's a lesson that every disciple of Jesus must learn. That to be his disciple, you must allow him to cleanse you. You must receive the forgiveness that he offers to you. That actually, paradoxically, the way into the kingdom isn't through doing, but through receiving. And paradoxically, because every other human organization in the world works the other way. Uh, you get in through either doing something or paying something. You get into the first 15 rugby team through being good at rugby. You get into a club or an association by paying the yearly fees. Now, you even get into a charity by being willing to contribute something of your time or of your money. But not so with the kingdom. Rather, realizing you have nothing to give, you get in through receiving. Now, the posture of faith that Jesus is looking for is just like the words of the old hymn. Uh, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to your cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Saviour, or I die. You see, the stain of sin doesn't come off as easily as dirt in a shower. No, either Jesus washes it off or the stain remains. And so the first lesson for the disciple is to receive, to realize that actually you need Jesus to serve and to save you, that it's not about what you might do for him, but rather it's all about what he has done for you. Now you could imagine a conversation between Jesus and a potential disciple, and the disciple comes up to Jesus and he says, Lord, I'll, I'll be a better person. And Jesus answered, I know, but you must be washed by me. Our Lord, I'll try better. No, but you must be washed by me. Our Lord, I'll, I'll give you money. No, but you must be washed by me. Our Lord, I'll even give up that sin. No, but you must be washed by me. And will you receive the cleansing that Jesus offers? However, what we've got in front of us 
uh, isn't only an object lesson, a gospel exhibit, but it's also a model for imitation. Uh, It's an example to follow. It's a father showing his son uh, how to drive with the intention that then the son learns for himself. And really, we got this idea last week, that in Jesus' life on this earth, he marked the path that he would have us to follow. And what's it in view here in these verses is not service to the world, as good and important as that might be, but it's service to one another, service to brothers and sisters in the faith. Uh, It's Christian service, and actually it's no more optional than Bible reading or prayer, or fighting sin. Those who have received Jesus' love reflect it. If you read verse 14 with me, uh, Jesus says there, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. And it's not vague, it's not hard to decipher If you're a Christian, Jesus calls you to serve your brothers and sisters in the faith. That's part of the reason why the whole idea of being a Christian in isolation or away from your church family uh, is an oxymoron. How can you serve sacrificially people who don't know you and you don't know? That actually while regular church attendance isn't the service in mind here, It is the foundation on which that service happens. Who's Jesus calling you to serve in these verses? Well, you can look to your left and your right. That's who. And what does this look like? Well, it could look like many different things. Right? We are unique individuals. God's given us a multiplicity of different gifts. God delights in diversity. But one way or another, God calls you to lay your life down for your brothers and sisters in the faith. I can think of examples that I've seen in churches. I can think of couples who have adopted, as it were, somebody who's lonely in the church and treated them as their own. I, think, I can think of people who look out for that lonely, awkward-looking person after church, standing alone and goes and talks to them and shows love in that way. I can think of cases of people who devote themselves intentionally to prayer. I can think of cases who, of people who deliberately draw people in. And maybe it looks like serving in one of the formal ministries of the church, doing sound, doing Bible reading, finding some area where you can serve? Are you financially well off? Maybe it looks like being sacrificially generous with the money that God's given you. Are you retired? Or maybe it means that actually retirement is not so much about enjoying the rest of this life as it is about serving your brothers and sisters in the faith. But one way or another, this isn't optional for the Christian. Each who has received Jesus' love must reflect it. And to be completely honest, our Christian service, the type that Christ intended in these verses, it's uncomfortable. It's inconvenient. It may not be any more pleasant for you than it was pleasant for Jesus to wash dirty, smelly feet. But the principle is ironclad and unbreakable. The servant of Jesus must serve like Jesus. And so part of the question this passage has for every disciple of Jesus is, are you serving your brothers and sisters in the faith? How are you serving? Who are you serving? Are those who receive his love must reflect it? And maybe you notice that actually this is a service that comes with a blessing. Blessed are you if you do them. That actually if you're not serving in the church, serving your brothers and sisters in some way, you're not only swerving from Jesus' pattern, but you're withholding blessing from yourself. 
You're starving yourself of a blessing that God wants to give to you. Will you follow his example? And the final angle or the final lens on which we can understand Jesus' words here is a warning to heed. Maybe you've picked up as we've read through this passage that peppered throughout it are all these references to Judas. So as far as we know, just before this, or earlier in the passage, Jesus has knelt on his knees and tenderly washed Judas's feet. An astounding action in and of itself. And Jesus goes on to explain what Judas is about to do through a quotation from the Old Testament. If you look with me at verse 18, Jesus says, I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. And maybe you picked up that that's actually a quotation from Psalm 41, which Andrew read to us earlier. And the whole verse uh, in Psalm 41 reads like this. It says, Even my close friend whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. You see, that's why Jesus' spirit was troubled in verse 21. Even my close friend whom I trusted. You see, there's a personal, relational aspect to Jesus' suffering that we sometimes miss and overlook. Jesus had chosen Judas, loved Judas, served with Judas, prayed with Judas, lived with Judas, invested in Judas. And now not only must he go to the cross, but he must go led by the lies, duplicity, and greed of a friend. You see, if we miss Jesus' troubled heart in these verses, then we've stripped Jesus of his humanity. In Matthew's account of the betrayal of Jesus in the garden, a Judas comes to him and he says to Judas these words, Friend, do what you came to do. Friend. Well, Jesus brings it into bear on this conversation with his disciples. Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And no doubt there was kind of just this shocked, awkward silence. And then Peter looks to the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, that's probably the Apostle John, the author of this book, his way of uh, talking about himself. And Peter gets uh, John to ask, who is it, Lord? And it seems quite likely that perhaps Jesus answered in a soft voice so that only John heard what he was saying, right? That's probably the reason why the other disciples didn't get it. And he says this, he says, it's he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I've dipped it. And he dips this morsel of bread and offers it to Judas. Now, on a formal dinner like this, as they were reclining together at table, uh, offering a morsel of bread like this was a mark of respect, of honor, of love. And it seems quite likely that this was one final, last demonstration to Judas of Jesus' love, one last opportunity for him to turn from the path that he had chosen Now, one commentator has captured it well. He wrote uh, this. He said, For one last lingering moment, uh, Judas' destiny hangs in the balance as the love of God incarnate shines one more time into his darkened heart. But the moment is no sooner present than it passes as Judas, in a final act of defiance, closes his heart against the light And turns away into the darkness that has no end. You see, when Judas received that morsel of bread from Jesus, it was a decisive moment of rejection. 
That's why it was at that very moment that Satan entered into him. The final opportunity for repentance is spurned. You see, there was another final sifting that must take place. Jesus has already separated from the crowds, and now there is even one of his own 12 disciples who does not truly belong. You see, Judas is really the supreme example of choosing hell on the very gates of heaven. He lived with Jesus, journeyed with Jesus. Jesus himself called him in this moment to repent, and yet he closed his heart against him. And surely in line with that whole thread of false faith throughout John's gospel, uh, it's meant to be a warning to us. Right, The very existence of Judas is a warning that it's possible to be part of God's people without truly being a disciple. That it's possible to know things about Jesus yet not truly be a disciple. That it's possible even to serve and yet not truly be a disciple. That's a warning that actually it's altogether possible to outwardly receive washing through baptism, feeding through the Lord's Supper, and yet never truly know the Lord. Rather, we must receive the washing that Jesus alone can give us. And so this is a warning to us, a wake-up call, saying, guard your heart carefully. Watch over your life. Don't let sin even get a foothold. Uh, Be warned that you too don't prove a Judas over time. Will you heed his warning? And so what does Jesus have to say to fairly average disciples like you and like me? Well, he's got four lessons for us, four truths that he would have carved upon our hearts. I know that it was his love for you that moved him to degrade himself, debase himself, to descend to the darkest depths for you. Know that you've been made perfectly, spotlessly, eternally clean through his death. Know that he calls you to walk in his footsteps, to sacrificially serve your brothers and sisters in the faith. And know that he warns you in love to hold fast to him, to guard your heart against the schemes of Satan and the pull of sin. And so if you're a Christian here this morning, as I know that many, if not most of you are, then Jesus is speaking to you right now. And he's saying, know that you are loved. Know that you are clean. Know that you must serve. And know that you have every reason to guard your heart carefully. Will you pray with me? Lord God Almighty, we do thank you for the servant king. We thank you, Lord, so much that, Lord Jesus, you did not come to be served, but rather to serve and to give your life as a ransom for many. And Lord, we openly confess that we need you to cleanse us, Lord, That, Father, apart from your Son and our Saviour, we're dirty with sin. We're guilty. Uh, We have stains on us that we can't wash away. And so, Lord, we thank you for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that we can know that just as it was with the disciples, so it is with us, that having loved us while we were in this world, You will indeed love us to the end. And we pray, Lord, that every day we might cling to the love of a serving Savior. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.